The Nerdcast Empire is on the air. We are back with yet another week of podcasting excellence, at least we hope, on the Nerdcast Empire. I am Matt in the studio, joined as always by Mike. Mike, how's it going? It is going all right. Got another week and another new concept of a show we're going to be talking about this week. And before we tell you what that is, we're going to be introducing from Parts Unknown, Chris. Chris, how's it going? Going great. Back after a short hiatus of a few episodes. Always great to have you back. And uh, it's uh, a busy time for all of us and uh, certainly great when we can all get together and do this. And you're going to be joining us in not parts unknown very soon. You're going to be in parts very known, like in our studio to do some episodes. We're really excited to have you back in person and get a chance to record some new content. So it should be a lot of fun. This week, we're going to be talking anime. And as we mentioned last week on the new music episode, the plan for this is to become a weekly episode where we talk about some of the new things going on in anime, some of the old stuff that we really like, maybe some upcoming releases as well, and also sprinkle in some news topics when there are news topics that are relevant. And that's what we're going to do starting with this first episode. And then eventually this will kind of fit into like a Wednesday or Thursday release each and every week. So we'll Uh, certainly let you know when that's going to be coming out but we're going to start off with some news and obviously not a huge shock because the the first steps of this has already taken place but it's kind of officially official that Funimation's website is going to no longer exist as of April the 2nd they're going to be shutting that down they have been merging content with Crunchyroll for years I think there's still a little bit of debate as to whether everything has gone over to Crunchyroll yet or not but Uh, This is going to basically be the final steps in the life of Funimation, and then everything will go through Crunchyroll. Obviously, there's some talk about Crunchyroll raising their prices. There's also talk about digital purchases not carrying over. So there's certainly at least a few people that are upset about that. I think, and we'll start with Mike, I think to me, we obviously knew this day was coming because Funimation, as far as a licensing company, no longer exists anymore. But This really does drive home the fact that a company that was a big part of us becoming big anime fans is no longer going to exist after April the 2nd. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that could be said about a lot of fans over here, especially those who got into it in the the early 2000s. Yeah, I mean, I know Dragon Ball Z technically wasn't always Funimation, but they're the ones once they took it over, kind of ran with it. I still think it's really odd that they're running with the Crunchyroll name as opposed to Funimation. like. I feel like that would be the equivalent of the UFL merging with the NFL and them deciding to go with the UFL name instead of the NFL name. I just I I find that really strange. As far as the pricing increase, I think another issue with that is uh, at one point Funimation had grandfathered a bunch of people into a lower price tier that now they won't be honoring with Crunchyroll. So they're now going to get bumped up even more than they would have already. And obviously the fear with that is always more piracy, but I, you know, I was kind of thinking it would almost be like if Apple decided they were going to buy Napster and then decided to keep Napster yeah. because Crunchyroll was an illegal site. That's where the uh, name, where it all came from was basically being a pirating site. And eventually, obviously they, they straightened out and became a legal licensing site, but it's, it's kind of weird that now it is the primary place to not only get, your anime as far as watching digital streams, but also where you buy your anime after they bought out the right stuff. So it's, it's kind of crazy that that happened. Chris, I want to get your thoughts as well. I know you're obviously a big DBZ fan, but you've watched a ton of shows on Funimation, both on the website and now, you know, in physical releases as well. Your thoughts on uh, Funimation being no more. Yeah. Uh, right in there with Mike's kind of thought process. It's weird that I guess Crunchyroll won out on this. Everybody kind of thought it was going to go the other way, especially coming from these conventions where Funimation was a huge industry panel that I I know we went to every year to see what was up for the new releases over the next coming season or the next coming year. Always visiting their booth at the dealer room to pick up the newest physical media releases. Um, And honestly, I always preferred, I mean, their, their UI definitely had problems. Um, on on their website but i always enjoyed them over Crunchyroll for their amount of dubs that they had available i mean that's where i got to watch steins gate show steins gate to a few friends that's where i was introduced to c control i know i mentioned that on one of our earlier episodes but yeah funimation is where i i kind of started my 
branching out as far as my my anime knowledge goes. So it's sad to see it go. And it's strange to live in a world without it right now. Yeah, Chris brings up a good point because they did have a ton of industry panels, especially like Ohio Con and even Matsuri Con where they would come in. And obviously the industry panel itself is something that has gone away as now shows are licensed simultaneous to their release in Japan for the most part. But still, it was always interesting to go to these panels and find out what was coming up and get to see trailers for shows that you might not otherwise check out. And it's an era in anime, like so many other things that we talk about that has gone away that, that kind of makes me sad that that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, for sure. And correct me if I'm wrong, but before all of this happened years ago, wasn't there a brief deal between Crunchyroll and Funimation where they actually worked together where Crunchyroll would tend to have the, the subtitled version of a show, whereas Funimation you'd go to for the dub? That's correct. And it actually ended up causing some problems when that deal broke off because you had these shows that were in some weird mixed licensing limbo where Funimation owned the rights to the dub, but maybe Crunchyroll had the license to the show. So you were getting these releases that maybe didn't have the dub on there because they were kind of caught up and all that. And I don't know if that maybe was the thing that the upper management of those companies was like, Hey, maybe we need to think of something a little more permanent as far as a relationship. Like, let's just acquire everybody. Let's right. do that. Let's just do that instead of this, this weird partnership situation. And uh, yeah, that didn't last very long. I don't think, but it did kind of cause some weirdness where, and I think that you still see the remnants of that weirdness when you go on the crunchy roll site and there's like 74 seasons of something listed because they have, 18 dub tracks and for whatever reason shows are listed as season two when it's really season one. So there's still so much of that stuff that needs to be cleaned up and who knows if they'll ever actually go back and do it because there's so much content there. You know, you found a really interesting document, Mike. I wanted to kind of talk about it. Unfortunately, this, this is the latest in a list of companies that at least during our fandom time, I think a little bit less as far as Chris, just because he's younger that we have had some sort of you know relationship with as far as watching their shows, buying their, their merchandise and they don't exist anymore. And it's, if you want to find it, it's on Wikipedia on the list of anime companies in the defunct category, which now Funimation will officially find its way in, but it, it's a staggering list. Yeah. Depending on your age, some of these companies you'll, you'll remember fondly, or at least remember to some degree. I mean, whether you're talking about someone like ADV films and, you know, their anime network, they used to run 24 seven as like an actual network, um, their new type USA magazine. That's no longer with us. Uh, you know, your, your Bandai visual central park media, Jenny on slash pioneer. Yeah. I've still got discs that have pioneer on there. Well, I mean, one of the retro shows I just watched recently, I noticed in the credits like, oh, wow, that was a pioneer show. I totally forgot about them. Manga Entertainment pronounced manga for whatever reason. Yeah, I never understand that. But it's like for them, they were huge way back in the day. I remember back on Sci Fi Channel in the 90s on Saturday mornings, they would run anime and a lot of it was licensed through Manga Entertainment or Central Park Media, you know, right stuff we mentioned before. Uh, one that I kind of thought about today and turns out there's actually a few locations left is Suncoast. Hmm. Like uh, evidently there are two standalone Suncoast videos left around, which them being, you know, one of the old retailers you would go to prior to probably going to write stuff. Presumably, according to the Wikipedia page, there's actually like a combination Suncoast FYE in a mall nearby. So <laughs> I don't know about that, but I mean, that's another just classic company that existed within our time as fans that that's no longer around. Yeah. And a couple more on that list that were worth mentioning. There was a company called Illumatune that was founded oh, yeah. in the mid two thousands. They were kind of a branch of Funimation where there were a lot of Funimation people that basically went off and did this thing to license some, I don't want to say smaller shows, but other shows that maybe Funimation didn't really have the time to deal with. They didn't last very long. And then Sync Point is one that I think a lot of people may not recognize, but they were basically the subsidiary of Broccoli. Uh, when Broccoli International USA shut down, they, of course, were responsible for shows like DigiCarrot and I'm, I'm going to be an angel, I believe, were a very limited number of shows, but they were out there quite a bit and they went away as well. But uh, it's kind of crazy when you look at this and think Funimation is going to be uh, adding to that list of, of 
defunct companies uh, that's just kind of crazy in the time of our fandom of being a, an anime fan. But the the question I always have, and I throw it to Chris for this, is sometimes I wonder, is this trend something that happens in entertainment generally and we just don't notice it? Like with movies, uh, you know, the studios come and go because they're they're just kind of interchangeable. Whereas anime, you feel like you get some sort of attachment to these studios because, the, you know, it's the cast, you know, it's the release quality, you know, it's the website you go to. So you wonder, like, is this is this actually unusual that these companies have come and gone in the span of these 20, 25 years? Uh, or is this just something that maybe we just should have expected was going to happen? I feel like there's a lot that's gone on in the background that we may not have noticed just because it it definitely feels like being into anime and it's definitely become cooler more recently. I mean, it in the past, I mean, you had to go find bootleg copies of DVDs overseas to order those. Like it has not been as easily accessible until much more recently compared to the overall media conglomerate. So I'd say a lot of that kind of flew under the radar just because it was kind of a niche thing. You know, you didn't really get to view a lot of these companies in the limelight like you do now. And now that it's widely available and more and more people are getting into anime, you you kind of get a peek behind the curtain. What goes on and kind of the, the changing of the guard that seems to constantly be happening. I think that's a good point, because now you see these big mainstream companies like your Netflix, like your Disney Plus, like you know, whoever actually getting into this world now, whereas before it really was just these specific companies and they were trying to find a way to get that Dragon Ball Z show that basically would fund everything else they were going to do because with Funimation, they were very small until DBZ kind of took off and they were able to get all the rights to that. And then I would say DBZ probably paid for a lot of what Funimation did from the late nineties through the, uh, maybe mid to late 2000s. So it's, you know, it's an interesting time where things are kind of switching, but he mentioned bootlegs too. I may or may not potentially still have a few bootleg discs laying around. I believe at one point I had bought like the Tenchi Muyo sets that were, because they hadn't been released over here. And then I had El Hazard uh, on bootleg because again, you couldn't, the sets weren't out for very long and they were out of print very quickly. And now it's the point where they're coming back around where you can get them. But uh, it was the the precursor to the fan sub was the really sketchy release <laughs> that trans, you know, you don't know, is it going to be a rip of the DVD or is it, it gonna- typically that same company had that same logo, like on every bootleg DVD set you'd buy. I mean, I, I remember having a Trigun bootleg for years before getting the, the authentic one. I think another thing with this too is, with these licensing companies, I think you were kind of forced to know them more because the product already existed. You were just looking at all these companies saying, hey, which one of you is going to grab this product and bring it to me? It's kind of like, you know, the name of the grocery store you go to, even if you don't necessarily care about what brand of thing you're buying from them. They're the ones who provide it to you. So you're going to know what happens with them. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And shout out to Greg Ayers, by the way. Greg Ayers always ran a really good bootleg panel which was really when i started to kind of have my eyes open to not only you know what bootlegs were but also the damage they did to the industry and i think he did a lot of good work that probably went unappreciated in kind of opening people's eyes and saying like look there's a bunch of sketchy stuff out there like try to buy the legitimate stuff to keep these companies in business even knowing what what brands make like wall scrolls like yeah. something you wouldn't have thought of otherwise but you know this his panel talking about that really educated you no question about that one of one of the the best con guests obviously also did some dj work as well and had a really good voice actor that and we don't get to hear as much from today but uh, certainly was was really good so that, that's Funimation. It's uh, unfortunately going to be a thing of the past, but we've still got all the memories and all the physical copies of our Funimation. You should DVDs. be watching. That was, yes, the old you should be watching, uh, like a Navarro company for a while. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, it was kind of crazy, but we'll step aside. We talked a little bit about Funimation in our first segment. Segment number two, we're going to tell you some of the new stuff we've been watching, and we're going to go into the vault, talk about some of the old stuff. Uh, that we would like to promote on the podcast. We'll do that on the other side of this timeout here on the Nerdcast Empire. Back on the Nerdcast Empire anime edition as we 
And I'll lay the groundwork for what will be a weekly anime show here on the Nerdcast Empire. Of course, don't forget to check out our website, nerdcastempire.com. You can check out our store, which is up and running and has been doing really well. And I guess uh, we can do a cheap plug for our store because Chris has just uh, received uh, an order that uh, his wife was nice enough to get for him for Valentine's Day. And I think uh, it sounds like you can give it a pretty positive review of the experience so far. Yeah, I uh, got a couple bumper stickers, got a hoodie that I absolutely love. Still waiting on the shirts, but I'm excited for the shirts because it has our little uh, slogan on the back of it. So and a uh, pair of socks as well, which also enjoyed those. I'm a big, big fan of interesting and vibrant socks. So that is very true. So I'm definitely interested to hear how those turn out. But uh, we don't make a ton of money on these. So we're, uh, obviously, if you go purchase something from us, we are, we'll make a little bit. But really, it is about just getting our brand out there and uh, continuing to build what we're building here, which has been a lot of fun to, to put together. So check it out, nerdcastempire.com slash store. In this second segment, we're going to be talking about new stuff we've been watching. And, and as I've admitted several times, I have not done as good a job watching new stuff, but I am doing better because I know we're doing this podcast, so I've got to have stuff to talk about. So we're going to start with Chris and, and throw it out to Parts Unknown to kind of find out what you've been watching. I know, obviously, you've got a crazy life going on, too, with, with the kids and everything else. But I know you've been trying to squeeze in some new things as well. So uh, what have you been checking out that maybe either interest you or maybe you checked it out and it didn't interest you either way. Yeah. So I'm still continuing on my journey through heavenly delusion. Uh, I've made it through about eight episodes of that. So I've got four or five more still enjoying it. I kind of already talked about the plot on that one in a previous episode and it's kind of a last year anime. So kind of in, in trying to keep with talking about more recent anime uh, last night, last second, I decided, you know, what, let's pick something from this season. So I went on Crunchyroll, watched the first two episodes of solo leveling uh, subtitled and absolutely loved it. Uh, it was, it was definitely a fresh take. Uh, it's got a little bit of shonen in there. I, I wouldn't call it a, an isekai. Uh, you don't really get your your hero transported anywhere in particular. It's very grounded in kind of the real world and the isekai elements come to the world and just affect the entirety of you know, everyone that's around. So that was kind of a breath of fresh air. I, did, I don't have to deal with another person being teleported to a video game or a reverse isekai where someone in a video game is teleported out necessarily. It was kind of a more grounded take on that. Um, enjoying it so far is definitely uh, dark, <laughs> even out the gate. First two episodes got me hooked. Uh, it involves, like I said, the, the real world pretty much as we see it, except one day these portals open up. And uh, these portals, if you go through them, lead you to essentially dungeons, which is where the isekai comes in, kind of video game style dungeons. Uh, you can go in there, beat enemies, beat bosses, gather loot. And uh, the issue being that after about seven days of these gates being open, if the the boss of the dungeon hasn't been beaten, well, then the gate opens up and they get to come out into the real world. Uh, around the time that these gates opened up, every, all these people around the world started waking up with special abilities. These people kind of began to get known as hunters, uh, very similar to Hunter Hunter in that way and other shonen. So... Not everybody gets a cool power. This story happens to follow uh, a character who is considered the weakest of all the hunters. Even in the lowest E tier dungeons, he's getting handled nearly every time. He's usually just laying on the floor getting healed. So uh, it's not necessarily a power fantasy out the gate, which is also kind of refreshing. But it's it's got some interesting takes on it. I mean, beyond just the narrative of this character being weak, figuring out how to how to get stronger and surviving some of these dungeons. Uh, it, it covers how the government is trying to utilize the resources from these dungeons and use them as a separate source of energy, which I thought was a very interesting take kind of covering like what if some of these these video game aspects came to real life and how would we try to regulate these things? Yeah, this was one I was actually thinking of picking up as well. It's got a very good score on my anime list, almost an yeah. eight and a half so far, which obviously it's in mid season, so that can always fluctuate. But it's definitely one of those ones when I was looking at things from this season specifically that that caught my eye. And, and I think, you know, it's a little gritty. It's a little bit 
as he said, a little dark. Uh, but those those shows are kind of fun because they're different than what I typically watch. I don't watch a lot of really dark shows, so it's nice to have them in there every once in a while. But definitely one that I, I think at some point I would like to check out. And it's interesting that it's taken this long to kind of get an adaptation because it's a story that's been being written since 2016. I believe at this point it's it's completed. So that's another nice thing is all the materials there. They don't have to make their own ending if they happen to catch up to the source material. Uh, and it's it's also interesting that it started out as kind of a South Korean web novel. Uh, I feel like I don't hear a lot of stories or see a lot of content coming from South Korea, especially South Korean web novels. So interesting that this is both held up as, I guess, what we would call a manga as well as an anime. I guess technically it'd be a manhwa, right? If it's yeah. coming from South Korea. Yeah. So. There has been a lot more Korean material coming over. It's definitely a, a more popular thing than, than it used to be. And, and that stuff tends to kind of retain a certain anime-ness where maybe some of the stuff from China still kind of has a different feel to it it's it's interesting it sounds like something fairly similar as far as world the world goes to some of the things i'm watching so it's it's i'm sure it's something i'll get around to as well and music from it obviously hiroyuki sawano involved in the open which yeah. is always a winning formula when you're you're bringing in an open together with tomorrow and together uh for the open and uh, krage for the ending which i'm not familiar with krage so i'll have to have to check that out but uh, yeah, Chris, that sounds like a, a really interesting show. I'd be curious to see you know, as you continue on with that, well, what that ends up turning into and see, see how dark it ends up at the end. Definitely. I'm excited so far. It's, it's, it's got its hooks in me. So awesome. Well, tomorrow together also is a Korean boy band. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense to have yeah. them in, uh, to work on that. I thought that was the case. They've done a couple songs for black clover. Of course. So I was vaguely familiar with who they were. <laughs> Anything else you want to add, Chris, or is that, that pretty much your, your new stuff so far? Yeah, that's the main one. I'm um, definitely going to check out a couple more episodes of that. But like I said, I definitely wanted to get a more recent anime, and this one seemed right up my alley, and I couldn't have been more right. So I'll let you guys know how it turns out. Yeah, definitely. Sounds definitely good. interested in hearing more about that. All right, Mike, we're going to throw it over to you. What is on your watch list currently? So, yeah, I had spent a good chunk of time on retro shows lately. Um my retro pick this this week will be kind of what that was. And it was a lot of episodes. So uh, jumping into something new, I, I first took a look at uh, Banish from the Heroes Party. I decided to live a quiet life in the countryside. Might be a light <laughs> novel. Might yeah, be. just just a little bit. The first season of it came out back in 2021. Uh, the second season is ongoing here in the winter of 2024. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of anything with a ridiculous title like that. And I feel like that seems to be a common occurrence right now where someone gets kicked out of a party and they got to, you know, find some new way of life. We'll, we'll revisit that as well. But essentially with, with this show, uh, the main character, well, every person and monster in this world gets endowed with some sort of gift, which is kind of like picking a class at the beginning of a video game and what that kind of does determines how powerful you're going to be, what what weapons you can use, like pretty much everything about you. The main character kind of gets this like, yeah, you're really good at all the basic stuff skill, but you can't do anything like your your combat skills will never reach that top level. So he, he kind of is, is limited to some degree. As a result, he ends up getting kicked out of the hero's party, the hero actually being his kid sister, who's tasked with defeating the demon lord's army. A member of the party basically convinces him that he's useless and he needs to leave. So he does. Uh, he settles down in this like boonie town, essentially, and opens up like an item shop. And that's basically the, the gist of, of the, the beginning of the show. Um, he ends up meeting one of his former party members and they open up the shop together. And of course, obviously, things don't always stay that perfect. They eventually come across the, the, the hero's party and all sorts of nonsense ensues from there. And, and him being kind of average good at all the average stuff it makes him like super overpowered as far as just living normal life so he the, everyone looks up to him despite the fact he's kind of useless in battle but yeah I, first season was good second season i'm a few episodes into it caught up with the dub but different but enjoyable yeah i mean there's there's so many light novel shows out there right now which if you're a fan of light novel shows is certainly fun because it feels like they're trying to find new spins on all these all the time so 
this is one that seems to have very solid ratings. Uh, you do see quite a bit about it. It seems to be it seems to be a pretty good show. I think anytime a light novel show gets a sequel, yeah, you feel pretty good about it because so many of these shows are kind of throwaway. So they get the one season, and then I've watched a few that are like that that I kind of enjoyed. That's like they're not going to make a season two of that. So this is probably a pretty safe pick as far as something that you're going to feel pretty satisfied at the end of it because they've decided to make more of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of interesting because like in his case, you know, his sister is the one who's like this legendary hero. And it turns out that that gift isn't all that great because you think about it. She has all these amazing resistances and, and, you know, ability to to fight. But because of the resistances, she can't really feel cold or warmth or her emotions don't work right because she's so resistant to feeling anything. So uh, it's interesting. The whole first season was basically she ends up meeting back up with him and they find a way to essentially kind of take that hero ability away from her and give her a new one. The second season, there's a new hero who doesn't quite share her kind of sense of morality and the the people, since these uh, gifts are given to them from God, people kind of treat them differently. Some of them treat them like this is your life. This is all you have to devote yourself to it. You know, make God happy. Others, maybe not so much. So season two could actually be a little heavier than the first one. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that, that continues to roll along. Anything else on the new front that you want to mention? Uh, yeah, just briefly. Um, one that I'd started watching a while back. It's a uh, show from about a year ago now. Winter of 2023 is uh, chilling in my 30s after getting fired from the Demon King's army. Uh, since I, I just watched Banish from the Heroes Party, I figured this one I needed to revisit as well because it's kind of the same idea. Only in this one, a boy was raised to buy one of the demon generals and was put into the demon king's army. Despite the fact, unlike every other demon, he can't use magic. Well, the son of this general who had brought this guy, this, this kid into the army hates the kid. So he ends up firing him. So kind of destitute and wandering out. He ends up running into this girl who takes him back to her village where lo and behold, you find out the whole time he was human and that's why he couldn't use magic. But in this world, humans are actually endowed with, the ability to be an adventurer where they have a rank and they learn skills. There's four different type of attack skills. And of course, this being the kind of show it is, he just so happens to be a master at all four right off the bat. I don't know where they're going to go and how far it's going to go. I think it only has the one season, but definitely an interesting show as well. Yeah. Again, those are always fun. And and, even if it is just one season, they're usually pretty light. So you don't feel like, I don't want to say you don't have to pay attention, but it's, it's not something, you know, like one show I'm going to mention in my section where you almost feel like you need to be taking notes while you're watching it. Like it's yeah. very easy to keep up with. And I think I would guess most light novels are that way. Like we're going to, you know, make it very clear who the main characters are. We're going to give you a very straightforward purpose. We're not, you know, we may have a few swerves, but for the most part, you should be able to follow along with what's going on. Yeah. And it's interesting that in both of these shows, you're kind of, presented with a situation where the main character suffers some sort of catastrophic setback. And even though they're, they're maybe not, they maybe aren't great at one specific thing. They have other skills that kind of carry them along and banish from the hero's party. You know, the guy can make all sorts of potions and and help cure diseases. And he knows so many just practical things that makes him super useful. And obviously with, with this other show, the character was really pathetic. So he, he, he had to kind of make do with what he had until he finally got that power. So it's just kind of an odd theme of, you know, starting over your life and, and finding a new purpose, basically. And it still kind of goes back to that tried and true shonen method where you have the main character that has something to overcome and has to work really hard to overcome that thing. And then they end up winning in the end eventually but exactly it's, it's kind of that grind so interesting definitely curious to hear how those shows continue to to move along the the shows i have i only have one from this season as i mentioned earlier so we'll talk about the older ones first i, I am continuing on girlfriend girlfriend the second <laughs> season uh, you know it's one of those shows i watched the first season and it was fine i second season started off okay The last episode I just watched was like episode four or five in the season was just kind of like, eh, like I kind of feel like I don't know. It might be maybe it'll save itself at the end, but it's going to be one of those ones that I think had this been the first season, I might have dropped it and just kind of moved on to something else. But it's like I'm already like 
17 episodes into this nonsense. So I'm going to, it's not as angry. I don't get as angry watching this show as with rent a girlfriend, which I just kind of hate watch at this point, but it's just kind of like, eh, this is feeling like a waste of my time more than it is like offensively bad. So we'll, we'll keep, keep everybody updated on that, but it's your typical harem show where the main character has a girlfriend and then another girl, like ask him out and he says yes. And then the two girlfriends kind of agree to be two timed. And so then the third girl comes in cause she's friends with one of the girls and doesn't understand why she's okay with being two timed. And of course she catches feelings for the main character And then there's a fourth girl who's like the obnoxious character that wants to go out with the main character, but the main character wants anything to do with her. So and it's it's basically a gag anime. So it's it's fine. Like I said, I don't know if it'll be anything more than that, but we'll it just seems like the season finale would be them all showing up on the Jerry Springer show. Kind of feels like that's where we're headed. I I don't know. It's it's one of those shows you watch with a harem that you know is not going to have a definitive winner. Like there's clearly not going to be one of those girls unless they just all leave this poor guy. And, you know, and, and like, he's not a pathetic main character. He's actually a, he's actually a good dude, which is probably the problem here because like he, everything else he does has like high morals, except for the fact he's cheating on his girlfriend with another girlfriend and they all seem to be okay with it. But you know, otherwise he's, he's a fine upstanding person. So it's, it's kind of strange, but we'll see where that one goes. I did finish one show that I have talked about a little bit, I think on the podcast, but wanted to mention it because I have to highly recommend it. And that was Oshinoko season one. I had watched the first episode of it, which if you have not watched Oshinoko and plan to know that that first episode is like an hour and 20 minutes long. It's basically like a movie for the first episode, but it's really important because it's basically all of the backstory that leads up to the momentous thing that happens at the end of that first episode that then kind of propels you forward into what's going to happen for the rest of the series. I told Mike at the time, I can't remember if I mentioned this on the podcast at the time and with recency bias considered, it's probably the first best first episode of an anime I've ever watched as far as, Obviously, having that long to tell a story makes a big difference, too, but it's it's so well done, really takes you into the show. And then, honestly, like I, I told Mike, I, I think I might have enjoyed that first season more than I liked Kaguya-sama Love is War, which is his other work. And that's one of my all time favorites. Uh, that was about as good an anime as you can do for a season. I'm certainly curious to see where it goes from here. And it's funny reading because I'm going to do this on the next two reading the anime news network description, like doesn't really give you (laughs) the full picture of what's going on, but it is definitely interesting. The anime news network description, which comes from the manga page says, uh, Goro Amamiya works at an OBGYN in a small rural town and is a huge fan of the upcoming idol. I Hoshino after an unexpected meeting, Goro ends up dying suddenly, only to be reborn as one of Ai's children, a boy named Aqua, Aqua Marine Hoshino, or Aqua for short. He and his twin sister Ruby then grow up as one of show business biz- biggest secrets. So that kind of tells you what's going on. Uh, it's kind of insane. Uh, there's Obviously, that first episode talks a lot about reincarnation. That's a, that's a big part of it. And, and obviously, if you watch it, you'll kind of see what's going on there. But it is a very well-crafted story. It's very dark. If you're going into this thinking you're watching a, a happy idol anime, there are certainly moments where you have poppy music, but it is very dark at times. And, and in fact, as, I, as I've mentioned, uh, High Dive actually went as far as to put uh, – like suicide warnings on two of the episodes and had like their suicide hotline information at the end of the episode, uh, which was, I think was a really, really good decision uh, to put that on there, but it is, it's really, really good. Uh, I can't really stress enough how good it was. And I can't wait for the second season, which will be coming out later this year. Um, Not really much more to add to that. It was just, It's just it's storytelling at its best. Honestly, I do remember reading that description of the show because people were making such a big deal about it when it came out and just thinking, what is that? That that doesn't that sounds absurd. And I think that's where the first episode is so important because it takes you through the most absurd parts of the show and gets to the meat of it. So it's like you make it through that first episode and you get to the end. You think, okay, that kind of all makes sense now. And then you get to the, you know, the 
the things that happen. And obviously I can't say what happens. If you're somewhat familiar with the story, you may know what happens in that first episode, but uh, it's very important. And it definitely leads to the motivations for the two twins going forward as you get into episode two and beyond and uh, sets the whole thing up. And like I said, it's super excited to continue watching that. It was really good. And the last one, and again, I won't get too deep on this one is Classroom of the Elite Season 3. Mike and I, actually, I, I kind of found this show. It was one of those, I just need something to watch. So I watched the first season of it, and I told Mike, I said, man, this, this show is actually really good. You should check this out. So he did, and, and kind of both agreed on this. Basically, and, and kind of going through the description on Anime News Network, Koto Ikse Senior High School is the leading prestigious school with state-of-the-art facilities where nearly 100% of students go on to a university or find employment. Students here have the freedom to wear any hairstyle and bring any personal effects they desire. Uh, Koto Ikse is a paradise-like school, but the truth is that only the most superior students receive favorable treatment. Kiyotaka Ayanakoji is a student in D class, uh, which is where the school dumps its inferior students in order to ridicule them. For certain reason, Kiyotaka was careless on his entrance exam and was put into D class. After meeting Suzune Horikita and Kikyo Kushida, two other students in his class, Kiyotaka's situation begins to change. I feel like that is the most glossing over of the plot that could possibly be done in a paragraph. Yeah, I, and it's funny hearing that now because it's like... Just knowing what I, I do, having seen the first couple seasons, it's like so clearly he was like purposely careless on this exam because that dude doesn't do anything without forethought and some sort of strategy. One hundred percent. Like clearly there is a reason he ended up there. And I don't know that we know what that reason is yet. I just always think back to the episode where they were trying to gauge how strong he was by his grip strength. And he like purposely gripped this thing that measures his grip strength at like the average, like human male grip strength. Like he knew exactly what to make it say. Right. And it's pretty much everything in that show is, is him manipulating something to his benefit, but then to get his way, but not stand out. Right. But then, you know, toward the end of the second season, you start to see people, there are people that know they're catching on that he's something. And, and that's what kind of leads into season three. Really, really good show. There are a lot of characters in this show, a lot. And I will say the one thing I do like about the beginning of season three is they're pretty good about reintroducing the people you need to know and reminding you of something important that they did in the show. So you remember, because it's hard to keep track of all those characters. But Absolutely. I, I, the, the main two were the only names I think I remembered, to be honest. Yeah. And obviously, uh, Kikyo Kushida, who you'll find out, I think, in season one that she's she's not all. She's she was the really up. nice one, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah she was. She, for, she was nice. Yeah, she was. So uh, and her story will continue in season three. But really good. Really enjoyed that. Dub is excellent. Uh, I've been watching it with the dub, which is painful because now I have to wait every week for new episodes and it's really killing me. Kind of why I haven't started yet. I'm just going to give it some time, you know, because it's easy to blow through episodes. But I, I recommend if you're on the fence about watching it, like try to shotgun it because it's going to help you to remember the characters if you watch as many episodes in a row as possible. So that's kind of what I've been into uh, new show wise. We're going to move into the vault real quick before we take our final break. And we'll, we'll throw it to Chris, who's had to listen to me ramble on about Oshino Co for 10 minutes. But uh, curious, Chris, if you have anything from your vault that you would like to talk about this week. Yeah, I plan on doing kind of a, a standalone episode about this. I think it warrants it. And also, just because I, we'll get into it when we cover some of our physical release information down the road. But I want to talk about the Berserk 1997 anime. Uh, for those who have never heard of it or haven't gotten into it, uh, Berserk has been around. It's one of the more widely known manga that's been around kind of in the same realm as Dragon Ball, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, as far as length goes, since 1987. Um, and... If if you don't watch it for the plot and you watch it for any other reason, I, I'd lo I would love for people to check it out for the amount of work that the mangaka put into it before he passed away a few years ago. Um, Kentaro Miura, every single page that you open of the manga is just so heavily detailed. And it's it's incredible in the fact that he has all this detail in his pages and we're up to over ninety five hundred pages, I think, estimated of this manga so far. It's still continuing even after his him passing away in twenty twenty one. 
Um, but the 97 anime, I still think to the, uh, to this day is the best rendition because there have been many awful renditions of Berserk throughout more recent years. I still think the 97 anime is the best interpretation of his opening arcs of that story. Um, I think if you're a person who's new to anime, you finally breach that getting over the fact that, oh, I'm watching a cartoon and you've realized that anime can cover some more serious topics. Berserk tackles most of them. <laughs> um, it's not for the faint of heart. You're, you're going to deal with, you know, torture, murder, um, some, pr- some pretty harsh topics, but it's, it's done so well. Um, music is amazing. The entire soundtrack is done by Suzumu Hirasawa. Uh, also did the original soundtrack for Paprika. The animation studio, uh, Oriental Lights and Magic, uh, also did another little anime that folks might have heard of. Uh, Pokemon, I think is how they <laughs> pronounce it. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, there's a lot of minds that came together to make this anime. It stays true to the source material for the most part. They did remove a couple characters and, and scenes just to make it a a little less intense than the manga, but still hold true to that. And also to fit it into a 25 episode length. But yeah, I I would highly suggest that everybody check out 1997 Berserk. And as I said, I'll, I'll cover more of the plot when I do my standalone episode later. Yeah. Definitely looking forward to that episode on that, because that is one of those shows that I feel like anybody who's an anime fan that's that likes getting into like the grittier, darker type shows always has berserk on their list because to me it's one that is as chris has said has really held up the test of time to the point where you can go back and watch that 97 show and and really not not miss the fact that it's not brand new i think it's it's really held up well i think that era does gritty really well as far as a style where, where maybe modern stuff tends to look a little too clean and polished. Like, I don't think that was really the case back then. Yeah. Almost. It's the fact that that era where you were just coming out of the cell era and into the, the CG era, but also you weren't shooting everything in high definition. Like it almost helps a show like that because it makes it feel darker and grittier. And obviously the storytelling of people behind it, phenomenal talent. And you mentioned OLM who's, uh, not only the involved the Pokemon, but so many other great shows and movies uh, as well. So, yeah, definitely interested in hearing more about Berserk 1997. Mike, what is your trip to the vault look like this week? Oh, my trip to the vault. It was a, a long and, and enjoyable trip, at least uh, kind of in that similar era. We're talking 95, 96. Um, you know, I've been going through those seasons back then and trying to pick out some of the heavy hitting shows. I, I did it last year with with numerous shows that i've wanted to catch up on uh in this case the one i watched was fushigi yugi this one definitely not not typically my wheelhouse i'm not really a shoujo anime connoisseur but this one's interesting because it was really kind of one of those early isekai shows before every show became one of those again mid late 90s there's a style there that you just don't see anymore Definitely one I would recommend it. it the, the dub is surprisingly good for I think the DVDs came out back in like 2004. So definitely an earlier dub. The characters were ridiculous, but enjoyably ridiculous. I know that's some of the negatives on it are kind of how absurd some of the different uh, support characters are. But I thought they were really, really goofy and entertaining. Um, there were a couple OVAs that happened afterwards where the story just kind of goes way even further out in left field than than the series, which is already ridiculous enough. You're talking about girls getting sucked into a book, talking about ancient Chinese legends, essentially. Um, you know, like your four like cardinal gods. The main character becomes a priestess of Suzaku. She has to round up seven warriors, essentially, to, to resurrect Suzaku. But, it, you know, it it bounces between that world and the real world a lot during the show. And Unlike some isekai, there's a lot going on in the real world with other characters that matters. Whereas in a lot of them, the person gets sucked into the fantasy world and that's all that really is important to the show. This one, I think, found a good balance between how do we make the real world still relevant while this girl is over in this ancient Chinese world, essentially. Funny show, definitely one I would I would consider watching if you're looking for that kind of if you've seen all the modern isekai and you're looking for something maybe that influenced those. I would definitely check it out. Yeah. And I think I remember it being a huge deal. It was always one of those shows that we would see 
I just never got around to actually watching it. And like you said, kind of going back and finding some old stuff, you, you finally do get around to some of those shows. And uh, you said it, it's an era that those shows look totally different than anything outside of that era it really is dated, but in a good way. And it's just great, great type of storytelling. It's definitely one that I want to go back and, and watch at some point, because I think it's, there are a lot of great long running shows of that era that, I hope people don't forget about because everything today is so new and polished and, and, and readily available. I think, you know, don't forget that you got access to a lot of these older shows as well. And and don't forget to go back and, and kind of see where all this stuff came from. And I'm kind of glad that a lot of these shows, while, while some have gotten the, the remake treatment and there are modern versions of them, I'm glad for the ones that haven't because it kind of forces you to go back and, and watch the original presentation of it. And, and kind of see that, yeah, even though this came out in 1995, it doesn't look bad. It just right. looks kind of classic, I guess. Yeah, I think there's, again, there's something about those shows from that era that, that I think I'll always be partial to. So yeah. definitely want to check that out. Fushigi Yugi, you both chose something from the mid 90s. I actually went a little more recent for The Vault, which is a bit of an upset because I've watched so many old shows. Uh, but kind of to tie in and, and to put a bow on this episode to bring it back to our first topic today, talking about Funimation. I wanted to talk about a show, one of my all time favorite series or franchises, if you will, but really the moment that they moved into Funimation. And, and that was a show from 2008. Uh, it was Slayer's Revolution. And it was interesting because I remember specifically when this got announced, we were going to conventions at times and Funimation would have their booth, the one just like Chris mentioned, and they would have you know, kind of higher ups at Funimation be working in these booths. And I remember specifically asking one of the people that worked at the booth, like, hey, any thoughts about licensing the new Slayers? Because by that point, I think Central Park Media was already gone and maybe, you know, anybody else that would have been involved with the original Slayers. At that point, in fact, those releases might have been kind of in limbo the first three seasons. And I'll never forget. And again, I have no idea if this was true because they could have told me anything and there's no way to know this. And I certainly I did a quick Google search and didn't find anything. But the person working in the booth told me at the time, like Slayers was Gen Fukunaga's favorite show. He yeah. was the CEO of Funimation. You, I think you were there too yeah. to hear that. So it was kind of like stay tuned. They couldn't tell me for sure they had it, but it was like stay tuned. And it wasn't very long after that they announced Slayer's Revolution and then Evolution are these the fourth and fifth seasons that were technically sequels to Slayer's Try, but Slayer's it's it's not a deep show necessarily, but it's just fun. Uh, it's one of my all time favorite series with some of my favorite characters. Of course, the music of Megumi Hayashibara and Masami Okui really kind of made that show sound the way it did. The dub it was great. And one of maybe the first opportunities where you had another company taking on a show and they were able to get the dub cast yeah. back from the originals. You know, they got Eric Stewart and Lisa Ortiz to come back as Gowrie and Lena. They got Veronica Taylor back. They got Crispin Freeman back. So you had those main four characters all back. And then and probably the biggest upgrade in casting history they bring in Mike Center Nicholas to voice Zelos uh, after David Moo voiced him in the original. and. Not going to trash David Moo, but, you know, he has a great voice for cartoons. He does. Yeah. Doesn't really work for a character as complex as Zelos, who's or just a character who's supposed to have kind of a normal voice. Yeah. I, you know, he has a very cartoony presentation to his voice acting. You know, I've, I've obviously watched Slayers in English and Japanese countless times. Uh, Akira Ishida played Zelos in the Japanese version, did a, a fantastic job with that character. And, and Mike Center Nicholas really captured that Ability to go from a silly character, which Zelos could be, to a very evil character at times as well. And it was a lot of range in that character. And I thought he really did a great job with it. But, uh, you know, I mentioned it because it was, you know, the beginning of Slayers moving to Funimation because eventually they did go back and get the original three seasons. And it's just one of my all time favorite series. And if you're just in looking for something fun, you know, there are some you know darker episodes, and I think at some point on this podcast, we'll talk about Slayers next, which is my favorite all time season of Slayers. The second season, um, there are certainly some episodes in that are very serious episodes, but the silly episodes are so much fun. Um, the, the Brass Rackets episode of Slayers next, the Artemis Tower episode, 
Um, it just that show has everything, and it's probably a large reason why that I'm an anime fan. And we got to watch it originally on International Channel uh, with subtitles in Japanese. A lot easier to watch than Dragon Ball GT with no subtitles on the International Channel. Yeah, which always followed Slayers. If I remember right, I think it came on like ten or ten thirty. Yeah. I think it was Dragon Ball GT. But the thing about Slayers Revolution is that was one of the first instances I remember where they were able to take an older show and modernize it while still capturing the essence of what made it look the way it did. Like it still felt like itself. Yeah, I would agree with that because it is very new looking, but it's not at the expense of the way the characters look. Like the world still feels the same. It's just like watching it on a better television than you watched it on before. So yeah. it's, it's kind of like that contrast when you watch uh, Dragon Ball Z Kai and you see the opening, which they reanimated, which looks really cool and modern. And then you go into the episode and it's just the original footage re it's cleaned up. basically, Yeah, like remastered and reconfigured to cut out some things. But like that was it. You, you saw what modern what the modern show could look like. I think other shows like that, like the new uh, Odyssey Yatsura. Yeah, still has that classic style, but looks good. Uh, mix is another one that they they had they have newer versions of that still has that kind of almost 80s looking vibe to it yeah it looks just like touch it's just now modernized version of that so uh, yeah it's just it was it's a great show definitely check it out it's like i said i've watched it subbed and dubbed i recommend both of them whichever one you prefer you're going to get a great cast so Uh, That's my trip to the vault. We'll go into the vault each and every week to talk about some older shows that we all love and we want to discuss on the podcast. I'll take one final time out. We come back. We're going to talk about physical releases. We actually have a nice list, courtesy of the folks at the Fandom Post, of some past and current and future physical releases. We will talk about those on the other side of this time out here on the Nerdcast Empire. Back on the Nerdcast Empire, one final time, Matt, Mike, and Chris with you this week. And... uh, Next week, we will be talking WWE Premium Live event, the Elimination Chamber, which will come your way at 5 a.m. on Saturday morning Eastern time from the city of Perth in West Australia. Curious to see how the card shapes up. I think it's still kind of a work in progress, kind of putting it together. So we will get a better idea what that's going to look like. But we will be reviewing that. And we'll kind of get rolling with these weekly episodes. In fact, our first weekly episode will be Music Mondays on the Nerdcast Empire. And you'll be able to find that wherever you get your podcasts on Monday. So tomorrow, as this is released on Sunday, check that out. We'll be talking about the music releases from the week of February the 2nd. So really excited to check that out. Mike's done a great job putting together a list. And we're going to go through and see if we can find some things we like and dislike off of that list and tell you all about it. But when I talk about physical releases, they do still do exist. Thankfully, uh, they haven't completely gone by the wayside. So I'll run down some of the January releases and then we'll kind of take it up to the current date. And then I know you've each had a chance to look at it. If there's anything in the future, I know Chris has one specifically coming up that he wants to talk about, but I uh, will let him we'll let you jump into the future. Talk about some things coming out starting in January, some big releases, uh, quintessential quintuplets movie. One I've been wanting to check out that was released by Crunchyroll. along with, is it wrong to try to pick up girls in a dungeon, uh, four part two. So that was released, uh, by Sentai Filmworks. Uh, the week after that, uh, one piece season 13 voyage four. <laughs> that is, uh, I don't know how many episodes are included on that, but another, uh, release for one piece. Love Flops released on the 16th of January from Sentai Filmworks. Uh, even though it says Lope Flops on this list, I'm pretty sure it is Love Flops, Renai Flops. Uh, one that I think people need to check out came out on January 23rd. It is Razafon Complete Collection Blu-ray release, a 2024 re-release. Another one of my all-time favorite shows. I definitely wouldn't mind picking up the Blu-ray of that and checking that out. I imagine it's going to look really good. Another one of my all-time favorite shows on the 30th, Bochy the Rock Complete Season, Season 1 released. Uh, that uh, sub only, it appears, from Crunchyroll, so that'll be uh, $70 for the sub only, but I will still be picking that up. Some other ones on the 30th, uh, Case Study of Vanitas, Season 1, Part 2, Lupin the Third, Sweet Lost Night, the Blu-ray from Discotech, 25 bucks. So that was uh, the release of uh, Magical Girl Lyrical Nanoha coming out on the 30th. Uh, for $40, definitely want to check that out. Uh, Mike mentioned Udase Yatsura. This is uh, TV collection number four. This was the original Udase Yatsura. The discotheque is going back and releasing. Came out on the 30th. 
Uh, Naruto Shippuden Set 2 Blu-ray came out by Viz. Also, Sailor Moon Super, Super S. Super S, is that how it's pronounced? I believe so. <laughs> Super S, complete fourth season. Super S. Super S. <laughs> it's like blends. <laughs> that one came out on the 30th. Uh, check that out if you're a fan of Sailor Moon. Uh, end of February, Handyman Saito and Another World Complete Season uh, came out on the 6th of February. Let's see. Looking at the 13th, One Piece Season 13, Voyage 5. Uh, Spy Family Season 1, Part 2. Both Blu-ray DVD and Blu-ray DVD Limited Edition came out on the 13th. Continuing on, uh, Paprika release actually will be releasing this week from Sony Pictures, a 4K UHD Steelbook. Uh, it'll be coming up on the 20th. Then to finish out February, a couple more discotheque releases I think people are really excited about. Uh, Dual Parallel Trouble Adventure, Complete Collection Blu-ray, a Handmade May Complete Collection, another one that people are excited about. Uh, Mike. Uh, mentioned chilling in my thirties after getting fired from the demon Kings army complete season will be coming out on the 27th uh, rainbow. That's one that I think I would like to check out the complete oh, collection yeah. uh, coming out at the end of the month. Uh, another, another great light novel title for you. I've somehow gotten stronger when I improve my farm related skills, complete collection coming out. And a couple of Pokemon movies as well will be coming out. So we'll start with Chris, Chris. I know of the things I mentioned, and maybe some other things that are on ahead. Uh, what kind of interests you off that physical release list? Yeah, as far as stuff that's been released or being released right now, Paprika really stood out to me. I'd, I'd be a, really interested in that steel book. That was one that was directed by Satoshi Kon. Uh, I think it was the last film before he passed away uh, in the early 2000s, maybe. But I absolutely love his work. I love Paranoia Agent. And then that soon led me to follow up with Paprika, which was a great movie. It's, it seems, as with most of his work, it's more of an art piece than a movie. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily for everyone. But to see it, you know, recent, being released nowadays, I'm sure it'll be tweaked and tuned and absolutely beautiful because just the scenes in that are immense. The entire plot is structured around a machine that lets you view other people's dreams. And it involves this character kind of intermingling with people's dreams, dreams being stolen, reality and dreams shifting together. It's hard to keep track of kind of whether it's real life, whether it's fiction. So a lot of just visual storytelling as opposed to narrative. And it, I, I can't imagine how beautiful it looks. So I, it would definitely be a steel book I'd love to get. And then jumping into the future to something that hasn't been mentioned, um, that Berserk 1997 TV series, Discotech, uh, their name popped up a lot on this list. Most of what you listed, I think, was coming from Discotech, and it seems they're doing a great job at bringing some of these older series back to life. And they will be releasing the complete 90, 90, 1997 series on March 26th of this year. So uh, if you're into physical media, especially if you've already checked out Berserk, I would definitely pick that up. I, I plan on doing so. You can watch the entire series on YouTube if you want to check it, give it a little try before you buy. But I think anybody that takes the time to sit down with it is going to love it. Yeah, those are great choices. And and before I throw it to Mike, we'll kind of tie all that stuff together. First off, Paprika, main character in that voice by Megumi Ayashibara, who, of course, was very responsible for Slayers and, and, and Lena Inverse. And to tie your stuff together, Chris, uh, Susumu Hirasawa, who does the music for Paprika, also, of course, did the opening theme for Paranoia Agent, uh, Dream Island Obsessional Park, the kind of strange open that was definitely really set a theme. He also did the first ending theme to Berserk 1997 with Forces. So uh, kind of weird how all that yeah. ties together. So uh, very talented guy, obviously. And. Somehow all the pieces fit as, as it works out, but uh, some really good choices there. Mike, your thoughts on the list. We'll also want to call out too. he mentioned Satoshi Kone. He uh, also directed the movie Perfect Blue back in 98, which kind of ties into the Oshino Ko thing. It's a very dark movie regarding a pop idol group, essentially. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but it, I remember it being really good. Yeah, that's a great call because you really learn a lot about the idol industry and usually it's not, not great. Kind of like the VTubing industry, as we found out. Yeah. It turns out that's all sorts of screwed up. Yeah. Thanks to, we won't get too deep into it. I don't want to get sued. Once we, once we start our news 
show for daily for, for VTubers. Yeah. We'll be able to do updates on that. Shout out to Doki Bird. Hopefully she's doing all right as she gets uh, through this. But anyway, let's get to your yeah. physical releases. Uh, a couple of things that stuck out, stuck out to me. Uh, one that I've not watched, but the title of it just stood out as something I may want to at least look at, if not probably not purchase without watching. But that was uh, on January 30th. Ningen Fushin. Adventurers who don't believe in humanity will save the world. Great title. I, I know very little about this show, but I, I, the title makes me want to look into it. Then we have February 13th, Spy Family Season 1 Part 2. I definitely need to collect that. Uh, and then on the 27th of February, chilling in my 30s after getting fired from the Demon King's Army complete season. I'll probably get into that as well. Yeah, those are all great choices and certainly interesting to see uh, how those uh, how those turn out and and you know, physical releases. Hopefully they do well. We certainly always recommend you pick up the physical releases to continue to have them coming out. I kind of mentioned the things that I was looking at, the one that's kind of a headache a little bit that would be interesting maybe to pick up because it's a show that I've never watched, but I've always enjoyed the music from, and that's Rose and Maiden. Uh, Sentai Filmworks is releasing the complete series on Blu-ray hmm. in April. So it's one of those ones that might be an excuse to pick that up, or maybe I need to go on a high dive and see if I can start watching some episodes and see if it's something that I would want to watch. But we'll be checking that out along with other, along with other physical releases that were, were certainly on this list. But I think that's going to wrap things up for this week and what will be our weekly anime episode. Our first one a little bit long, but we will be kind of shooting for the 30 minute range when we start doing this each and every week. And we'll be coming to you to bring you the latest in anime, go into the vault, maybe some news items as well and uh, continue to um, build things out. We're looking forward to giving you some anime conventions as we continue to roll on in 2024 and uh, hopefully be able to do some interviews as well. when we get to those anime conventions. One last thing before we sign off today, I did get a question through our website about something anime related. Somebody had emailed us a question asking wow. if we were going to do hentai reviews. Uh, the short <laughs> answer is no. Um, for two reasons. Uh, one, <laughs> this is a PG-13 podcast. We probably will not be able to talk about those with any kind of justice without going past the PG-13 line, which would be kind of funny if we did PG-13 <laughs> reviews of those. But um, but we will, we will not. And secondly, the people who do review those things are going to do a much better job of reviewing those things than we Maybe. would. I don't know. I presumably, I don't know who reviews them. I'm sure you can find them with a good Google search, but I uh, might want to make sure you have your antivirus all up to date before you do that. But uh, appreciate the questions. If you have other questions for us, please send them out. You can hit us up on social media. You can send us questions through our website. They do show up in my inbox and uh, we'll try to answer them as they come in. Even if it's something that is just simply and no, we're going to continue on with this stuff. So I appreciate the feedback as always to make sure to uh, reach out to us here and there. And we'll, we'll try to answer the questions as we get them in, no matter how strange they are. So on that <laughs> note, that, that is going to wrap things up for this week of the Nerdcast Empire. Huge thanks to Mike and Chris for joining me once again. A huge thanks to Stove Lake Media. Uh, Nate does a great job. Continue to help us out. Continue to look to build our partnership into 2024. A huge thanks to everybody that's bought things on our store so far. We really do appreciate it. And again, we're not looking to, to get rich off of that store. We're just looking to uh, try to cover some of our expenses. And the biggest thing anybody can do is just listen in, leave us positive reviews on your podcast sites. Those continue to help us out tremendously. Tell a friend, tell an enemy if you want. It doesn't really matter to just get people listening to the Nerdcast Empire. And we would certainly appreciate that. That's going to wrap things up. We'll be back with you actually tomorrow as we have our, the beginning of our Music Mondays on the Nerdcast Empire. So make sure you check that out. And of course, we'll be here each and every Sunday with the latest topics from the Nerdcast Empire. That's going to wrap things up for this week. For the entire crew, I am Matt saying so long. Don't forget to join the Empire, the Nerdcast Empire. <laughs>